Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar video. This is going to be my next Legacy of Yang Chen chapter analysis video. And this one is going to be for chapter 13, which is called Mitigation. So, like I said, the uh, unique way in which the previous chapter ends, and then what we do in the early stages of this chapter, makes for this kind of mysterious kind of resolution to the, uh, the action that actually happened at the end of the last chapter. But... We obviously get some reveals about the net result, even if the details are missing. But, you know, like I said, we'll come back to that later on in the book. But a very interesting chapter that deals with effectively the aftermath of this incident. is It is very much the case that Thapa gets away. Uh, and so there is one combustion bender left and he has fled he has managed to escape and we just deal with yang chen dealing with the yang chen kavak and, and the rest of the team the whole northern air temple basically dealing with the aftermath of this escape attempt that's what this chapter is about plus we have a uh, kavak's first report to the order of the white lotus uh, right at the end so a uh, bit of a longer chapter here i think it's just under 20 pages so um, quite quite a big one to get through here so uh, we start off with uh, Kavik, uh, he's kind of worried, kind of waiting for uh, Yang Chen to come back. Um, it's noted here that uh, none of the airbenders involved like across the temple have been killed. So none of the 18 kind of uh, put in charge of watching any of the um, combustion benders have been killed. Uh, a couple of them uh, kind of have woken up since and have reported that, you know, they didn't hear anything, hear or see anything, and they just got hit in the back of the head, knocked out, and that's what happened. Um, but then suddenly Yang Chen you know, uh, arrives into the room. Uh, she has Ming Yur on her back. Uh, he is injured. She doesn't appear to be injured. Um, and she's immediately straight down to business of like, Jujinta, cordon off some space here. Kavik, we're doing the healing like last time get a bunch of water uh, and so that's what Kavik does straight away he, he gets a bunch of water com completely basically engulfs um Ming Yur in it she starts to heal but there's a little bit of a twist here she notes um his lungs are ruptured from a shockwave they've come collapsed like empty water skins inside his chest keep him elevated and steady do not move so Kavik is expecting just a really long lengthy healing session where she's just going to do the you know the, the glowing stuff uh, as we would expect from healing but instead it's noted here yang chen stabbed the man instead uh, with short, crisp hammer of her fists, two sharp points of water pierced into his chest. And then she does this really interesting thing where she kind of like basically, she takes control of like the bubble of water and sort of like kind of compresses it kind of through the um, kind of water needle effectively she's put into his lungs and uses this as a way to kind of, uh, kind of effectively reinflate his, his lungs and kind of get him uh, breathing again. So Kavik is like stunned by this that like, whoa, Yang Chen has effectively performed some sort of a like healing slash field surgery on um, Ming Yur here to save him. So um, he, she of course does a lot of healing immediately after this um, uh, as they're kind of like working together. So the, the kind of panic stations, you know, absolutely dangerous part is done and um, and then uh, Kavik finally gets to like, okay, I, I need to talk. I need to give a report to her because, of course, she doesn't know yet what happened with like Kavik and Jujinta's mission. Uh, she doesn't know about Hansha yet, so she, he has to give her the briefing. And she's like, uh, could we go somewhere private now to discuss this? But she's like, no, nope, tell me now. I want it right now. So, um, of, of course, we don't go through the whole thing of him actually, you know, text of him explaining the whole situation. But yes, we cover the basics, you know, um, Chaos of the Rock Slide, Hansha had been crossed off, likely by Kavik's brother Kalyan. Kalyan had bribed a group of villagers to serve as a distraction and then escaped out the window down the mountainside. He was a skilled enough climber and waterbender to have pulled this off, uh, the daring escape. Um, that's what happened. Um, so from here, this is when then it is noted that more people enter the hospital. People holding stretchers and they head off immediately in the direction of the mortuary. So these people are dead. 
and they know straight away who these people are because they're trying to kind of cover them up but these two people are giants basically and um, so um the cloth slips off one and it's immediately revealed to be Zhao Yun he is dead then the other one they notice the the braids of a uh, Ying Su's head coming down from underneath the sheet and it's Ying Su she's dead as well so it's this shocking reveal here for sure um two members of unanimity were dead the third unaccounted for any plans the Avatar or the White Lotus might have had for the Firebenders were in complete disarray. And, and this is the point of which the whole, like, Kavik betrayal plot is really turned on its head. Because now, effectively, he can't do the full betrayal of Yang Chen because he can't give up information that, like, the, uh, the White Lotus wants that they hadn't really agreed to in the initial discussion with Yang Chen. So this is kind of what I was referring to uh, from before. But it also confirms to us that, oh, I guess one detail of the events from the end of the last chapter was that, yes, Ying, Ying Su was killed. But it still doesn't answer the question of like, wait, Yang Chen jumped up and effectively intercepted Ming Yur. How did only he get injured and she didn't really get injured? Um... You know what exactly happened here but um you know pretty shocking turn of events like i don't think anyone called the idea that we will be down to one combustion bender within the first third of the book and this is before even the like major kind of event of this book even happens as such so um very very interesting uh things of course um at this point the uh what's this the the captain of the guard of the village basically the, yeah the village captain walks in and Kavik thinks like they're like wait your turn like you don't appear to be injured you know like we'll, 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 we'll get to you in time but it's like no no I want to know what happened to the gifts that the avatar brought back from the northern chief and Kavik's like, why are you talking about this right now? You can see, like, people, are, like, you know, the combustion menders are dead. Um, there's people who are injured. We have to deal with this, the crisis that is happening right now. Yang Chen's like, I, I had to cut them loose because, of course, she needed Nujian to deal with the rock slide and everything that happened. Um, she wasn't focused on making sure those gifts were okay. And he's just kind of thinking about, like, you know, uh, like we need them um, for like like uh, the alms like the, the value of those gifts is important for the the village and it's like you know that's a relatively okay point but it's the wrong time to kind of bring that stuff up right now um, and he just continues to go in on this like we need you to find those gifts uh, if not you airbenders should find those gifts and Kavik's like go look for them yourself and he just continues to go on like avatar 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 you better have a plan to fix this and yang chen just absolutely loses it with this guy and it's just described here that she just clenches her fist and this mo motion on its own sends the village captain absolutely flying out the door like this is not just a thing where she knocks him over with airbending he is hurled a massive distance out the door into the air and it is this like shocking moment where like everyone quickly realizes that like he's gonna land outside and there's a high likelihood that he's gonna die that's how like violently he's been hurled out the door and Kavik of course is the first one to react to this like he goes like sprinting out the door and is like okay I've, I've got to fix this problem here we, we can't have Yang Chen having killed the village captain so he uses the the, the a unirac kind of step one step two step three situation of use your environment to your advantage so he creates like a net of water and realizes like okay what can I use to cushion the guy's fall oh, there's some, like, trash, basically, here that looks fairly kind of safe. So he kind of grabs that all up in a net. And it's it's meant to be sort of like Kavik's version of how a Unirac saved Doe from the fall down the stairs in the previous chapter, except it's a, much more of a quote-unquote natural situation kind of happening here. And he does manage to save the village captain. Um, 
And it's just this desperate situation of like Havoc reacted like immediately to what happened here. And the guy can, when he gets up is still like, you know, I can't believe she just did that. Um, you know, she's going to hear about this. Mark my words, she's going to hear about this. And Havoc's kind of like, you know, what is with this guy? Like, I'm wondering if in saving this guy and not letting him get injured or killed, have I, like, given Yang Chen more trouble in the long run? Now, I don't believe this is a plot point that particularly comes back. It is mainly here to be this moment demonstrating that, like, Yang Chen, even though she most of the time keeps her cool in these situations, is really struggling with what's going on here and like the fact that she has you know had this outburst of emotion like this um is quite intense again somewhat similar to i, I think the way she reacted when um boma got hit during the parade right before the meeting with the uh, shang merchants in the first book she had a little bit of an outburst there so um kind of similar stuff uh, going on here um then we get a cut in the chapter and uh, we basically then this is the sort of um, the debrief with the team. So Yang Chen gathers the team together. They're in a specific chamber of the air temple. It's noted that there's a lot of uh, candles around, of course, that it's a training um, area mainly here. So um, they're all here, you know, Jujinta, Taigum, Akudan, uh, Kavik, and then Yang Chen is, of course, leading the meeting, of course. Um, so they note that kind of how it kind of tense this situation is, and Kavik kind of even realizes that, like, this is actually somewhat similar to most of the team's meetings from before, because, yes, there's Kavik's betrayal, but even previous times when they'd had these type of meetings, it was always a little bit frantic, heat of the moment, like, they never really had too much of a chance to just take stock of what's going on. So Kavik straight away asks, is ming Yur going to make it? She says he'll recover, but I don't know if he'll ever hear again. So his um, uh, eardrums obviously have been really badly damaged here. Uh, so he got hit with quite a bit of a shockwave, at least. That, that, that was described as being the injury to his lungs as well. So it's also affected his hearing, but she can't seem to uh, heal that. Because that's always the thing with like, uh, healing in a way. Like there's, there's limitations on it of like, if someone is like super critically injured you can't heal them there's only so fast healing can actually work uh, unless you have like say uh, spirit water like that's kind of what happened to jet in a way and so then there's this other aspect of like can healing deal with stuff like that like an injury that like makes someone sort of like lose one of their senses or something like that can it do that uh, and so this seems to kind of be saying like realistically not um so um uh, that's an interesting one and um, so yeah uh after this um taigum asks about like oh are the town folk towns folk like asking questions about like what specifically happened are any of them suspicious about like why explosions and stuff like that went off uh yang chen just notes that um no and um, because uh, the rock slide was basically the first thing that they saw, they just assumed that it was more of a natural disaster. And, you know, they're used to kind of hearing stuff in the mountains. So they've managed to kind of get away with this for the most part. And uh, then she notices that like, oh, someone's not willing to just uh, speak out and ask a question. Someone's put their hand up. It's uh, Jujinta. And she's like, yes, Juji, <laughs> um, question. Um, and he's immediately like, should he be here for this? mentioning uh, re referencing Kavik so we can see that Jujinta is the member of the team the most upset at Kavik overall um in a way and, and Yang Chen says you know I believe so um I think he's just about uh, deserves to be here and um, but anyway then we get the kind of uh, the kind of details of kind of specifically what happened so it's mentioned here uh, like how did this all go down there's a deeper understanding so, uh, about six weeks ago, Thapa, after devel developing a rapport with his guard, convinced one of them to take a written message to his mother to assure her he was okay. Uh, curse the soft hearts of my people, right? Uh, all of our efforts undone by a letter to family. Uh, before agreeing, the guard read the letter and found nothing that would disclose Thapa's whereabouts, and he left uh, it at a message post in Jiangui for further conveyance. 
but based on his recollection of the contents, I believe it contained coded instructions for Chai Si to rescue him. I don't think Thapa's actual mother, whoever she is, had the resources to survey the mountains, prepare a net under his cliffside hut, and coordinate his jump into a freefall dive uh, during a guard rotation. I found the rigging they left behind. Quality work. So um, there's what happened. So Thapa um, got was friendly with uh, some of his guards, sent a message that they read and they checked and it didn't seem like there was anything to it. Uh, this is the letter that uh, Chaisi got in the first chapter of the book that was uh, kind of a bunch of kind of garbage basically. But it's uh, this is what kind of confirms to you the full connection of like, yes, Chaisi is ultimately behind it, but it's also, you know, mentioned directly uh, here. Uh, coded instructions to Chaisi to reference him um, because that's the only way the whole Kalyan stuff can make sense. But we'll get to that in just uh, a second. But yeah, the whole idea of like... Um, Surveying the mountains, preparing a net underneath the hut where he was, um, kind of climbing equipment, climbing experience stuff uh, being referenced here. So it seems like a full crazy um, uh, spy-esque escape um, situation here. Akudan asks, what happened to Thapa's guards? Um, and again, none of them were killed. He only blew up enough of the mountain to stun them and cover his uh, tracks. Um, and then this is this is where she reveals to everyone that yes, um, my theory is his rescuers also scouted the locations of the other firebenders. Thapa then betrayed them all and killed the other members of unanimity. So this is the reveal to basically everyone else. They're like, wait, Zhao Yun and Ying Su are dead, and they're like, wait, wait, why is this? Um, how, how is how is how does that go on? How, how did that work? Um, so, yeah, it's mentioned, yeah, n none of the guards from any of the uh, combustion vendors were as badly injured as ming -Yur. He's the, apart from the fact that Zhao Yun and Ying-Su are dead, ming -Yur seems to be the only serious injury going on here. Um, but, yeah, they have not been able to find uh, Thapa or track him, and they're convinced, like, they won't be able to find him before he kind of leaves the mountain range, basically. Um, this is where they bring up weight. Why would one of the combustion menders kill the other two? Why would Shaisi want that done? And Yang Chen's just like, I believe Thapa went rogue here. And that, you know, before there were three valuable assets. I know the way Thapa is. Him getting rid of two valuable assets turns him into a priceless asset. Uh, that's my logic to this situation. He is now the most important prize in the game, um, and he's done that by eliminating the other members of the team. Um, so yeah, Kavik even knows, like, well, that's rough. Uh, killing your teammates to get a raise. That's what happened here. Um, and yeah, Chaisi is smart, but no one can predict everyone. And she's like, tell everyone about your brother. So Kavik explains the whole idea of like, you know, yeah, okay, Hansha is dead. I'm pretty sure my brother was the one who killed uh, him. So what's going on there? Because Taigum is then like, wait, 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 wait. Because he also explains the full backstory of what he knows of um, Kalyan's connection to Han Shu. Because again, uh, this is what Kalyan explained to Kavik in the chapter they had together. Like he actually gave him the kind of uh, what I've been doing since there. So he relays that to everyone here. So it's like, why would uh, you know he kill Han Shu if they used to be friends in Bin Ur? And Taigun was like, does backstabbing run in your family? Aiming that one very squarely at Kavik, of course. Um, and it's like, yeah, because it helps Chai Si, uh, Hansha could have testified about her plot to the Earth King uh, or another ruler. My brother chose his second boss over his first. So that's the logic they're going with here, is that um, after he did the thing to get unanimity into the hands of um, uh, Chai... Uh, oh, into the hands of Han Shu, he seemingly managed to find a way to regain the trust of Chai Si or keep that away from her and has now kind of committed himself uh, full loyalty to um, Chai Si. So that's what's going on here. But like I said, there's, there's still a little bit of a kind of mystery in all of that of like, wait, that, that kind of almost implies like she's kind of like 
forgiven him for the betrayal or has let it slide in some way what what's the the, the details here they're, they're missing some sort of a thing but it makes too much sense that yeah for whatever reason uh Kalyan is back to kind of normal in a way he's just working for Chai C and um she's his, uh, he is her lieutenant and, and that's what's going on here basically so, um, they know just, like, we are so far behind in this situation that, like, Chaisi, but also Kalyan are both ahead of us. Like, this is a really bad situation. Um, so, what is the next move? She fills everyone in on the whole Taku uh, situation here of, like, she wanted to use unanimity uh, to attack Taku and take out the uh, world leaders. And her logic is that she is going to execute that plan again. Uh, and she really only needs one firebender to do uh, permanent damage to the world. So that's kind of what was going to have to happen. We have to go to Taku and uh, take uh, get, take Thapa off the board. That's the situation here. Uh, and she's just like, yes, Juji, that means Kavik is involved as well. We need every resource on this mission completely. Um, and... Yeah, the, the, then we get into the whole idea of, um, you know, Jujinta is forced to be like, um, okay, I understand that, I get it. The only reason we kind of were able to take down the Firebenders in the first place is because uh, Kavik did scout out ahead of time and stuff like that. Um, but, um, you know, can we also not get the help of the Airbenders as well? But Yang Chen kind of leaves this one a little bit short and is just like, I don't think we can count on support from the Northern Temple anymore. Um, and she doesn't say anything more. Uh, Akudan and Taigum are both like, yeah, we're probably a bit too old for uh, frontline work these days, but I guess this is what we have to do. There's a little bit of a kind of <laughs> moment between the couple here where they're just like, it'll be like when we met on the job before the Platinum Affair and the stint in prison. And Kavik's just like, wait, I know more about like your specific thing. You, you guys were quartermasters, like supply managers, you know. The toughest action you ever saw was like dishing out stew. And they're like, okay. <laughs> um... At this point, Yang Chen is like, okay, give me the room, but Kavik, you stay behind. Um, there is a fun moment where Jujinta, just before he leaves, is kind of like, he, he looks at like Yang Chen and Kavik and is just like, you know, convince me one last time that I should let this go. And she's just like, he's not a threat. Um, it's okay. Um, that, that, you know, it's okay, Jujinta, it's fine. Um, so he leaves and then she immediately is like, was that enough for your report for the White Lotus? I know you're now going to have to report everything that happened here to the White Lotus. Do you need like more details or anything like that? You are basically an errand runner for the Order of the White Lotus. Like you can report all about my failures and how badly I've done here that an incompetent child uh, has lost these resources in the world. Uh, and she really kind of um, goes in on herself here. I lost Han Shu, a valuable witness. I let two of the most valuable assets in the world die at the hands of the third. I, I nearly cost the village and the air temple more lives. Um, and she is kind of almost asking Kavik to jump in and be like, yeah, you did some pretty bad stuff. But he actually kind of defends her here and is like, uh, I think a Unirak has to kind of uh, basically um, work on her own work of making that come across super well before she starts kind of going after your stuff. Um, and I don't really feel like I need to kind of have much of an opinion here. Um, but she's, but he, he's just noting here in this moment that, look, I don't have to kind of represent the white lotus while i'm here i'll report to them but i am here to help you kind of work for you not to act like a unirak when she's not in the room basically like i'm not here to criticize you like the white lotus would because as we'll sort of find out we've already kind of get the idea like he doesn't really like the order of the white lotus kind of philosophy on things and does actually appreciate Yang Chen's approach and the effort that she puts in so this is completely honest and there's a little moment between the two where like she's kind of genuinely surprised that this is the kind of uh, perspective that Kavik has taken up um, and he's like oh I get the impression she doesn't quite hate me maybe anymore so um 
that's what's going on there. Uh, at this point, uh, Abbot Sonam uh, walks in. So he's, of course, the leader of the Northern Air Temple. Um, and he notes that, like, oh, Kavik, uh, thank you for your efforts in the hospital. You seem to have a knack for healing. But he's like, eh, I don't really know how to heal. But he said the advice here is sometimes the greatest medicine is uh, providing the right assistance at the right time. Um, Mingyur is awake and doing well but when they're like oh we should go to see him the abbot is, is like there's no need avatar I have a quest for you a matter of great urgency and Kavik's a little bit like "Ooh, that was a little like turning the the, the conversation in a specific direction um, and Yang Chen is immediately like ah was expecting this okay Kavik you stay here while I have this conversation with the abbot um, tradition dictates a witness and it's this very interesting um, kind of uh, air nomad thing. Like, uh, before I get into this, I suppose, like, effectively, this is Yang Chen being exiled from the Northern Air Temple. What happens here? And Kavik is just watching them as they go through this kind of, like, ritual. Um, and it's kind of almost, like, White Lotus-esque in some ways with the way the language is and the, the lack of, like, clarity of just, like being clear about what's going on. But um, Sonam says, uh, Sister Yang Chen, the community of the Northern Air Temple desperately needs a boon. Only you can provide. After you next leave these sacred grounds, our existence depends on you returning with treasures of great importance. Yang Chen says, O oh, elder, I devote myself fully to this cause. What shall I retrieve from the four corners of the world? A blue panda lily, the shadow of a breeze, the sinews of a spirit, and most important of all, uh, the material possession that will fill the emptiness that lies in every human being. And Kavik is just like, wait, this this isn't going where I think it's going. Uh, Yang Chen says, when you see me next, you will see these jewels. So I swear. Thank you, sister Yang Chen. Carry the love of your people with you always. And when he gets up, like he has a tear in his eye. The abbot has a, a tear in his eye at having to do this. And he just leaves. And Kavik is like, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. There's no way this is actually what I think it is. And Yang Chen's just like, oh, you got it? And it's just like, yes, Yang Chen had been exiled from the Northern Air Temple. That these were tasks that are impossible to accomplish. Again, going back to it here, a blue panda lily, I guess, is a flower that can't possibly happen. The shadow of a breeze, of course, doesn't exist. Uh, the sinews of a spirit, as in like a physical aspect of a spirit. Um, the material possession that will fill the emptiness that lies in every human being, of course, the whole idea of like, you won't find true happiness or fulfill yourself with just a material possession. So impossibilities here. So she's been fully exiled here from the Northern Air Temple. Uh, and of course, Kavik doesn't really think it's particularly fair because she's saved everything. But as Yang Chen has kind of been pointing out over the last couple of chapters, like her influence as a kind of leader, but also as an air nomad has kind of had a somewhat bad effect on the area of the Northern Air Temple and around it. Just with what she has brought there, some of the influence she's had of like having some of her brothers having to become jailers to continue up her sort of spy master kind of antics. Um, I think, you know, you can justify it to a certain degree, like, um, and you can kind of criticize this sort of in a very similar way to the way that um, uh, Kelsong from the Kyoshi novels was also effectively, you know, he's considered effectively dishonored by like the air temples. Like he's never going to be considered in history the legendary airbender that he actually is because of some of his actions. And it's kind of a similar thing happening here where it's just like, you don't typically expect this from the airbenders, but he, the, the abbot has decided that like, you've kind of forced me to do this, like in a way for the sake of, the Northern Air Temple going forward, you can't come back here. Um, so yeah, Kavik is like, you you know, th this is bull pig. You, 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 you're the avatar, overrule what he just said. And she's like, no, I'm a member of my people. The abbot is responsible for the community. I'm not going to disrespect kind of my own traditions by undermining his authority. And she's trying to kind of tell him to calm down, but he's getting more annoyed about the fact that this doesn't seem to be having an emotional impact on her. Or if it does, she's hiding it for some reason. Um, 
And she's like, you know, relax. Uh, I can still look after this village from afar. He's like, why are you acting like this? And um, she's like, there's other temples I can lay my head at. Um, and then he brings up, uh, what about like the sunset from the tower, your sister's favorite place? And she just kind of screams at him. I said, it doesn't matter. And the, the candles go out at this point. Um, this is a kind of dark emotional moment for her. And she says, I need to be held accountable. Uh, if I can't be an airbender when it comes to my actions, I can at least be an airbender when it comes to the consequences. Rest, we have a lot of work ahead of us. So a pretty emotional moment there at the end of like Yang Chen being exiled here for effectively what she has done, bringing near catastrophe to the Northern Air Temple. Um, and she just has to accept that, you know, the she needs this in a way like she can't act above this because she's the avatar this is something she has to take to kind of show that she still is an air nomad um but then we cut to uh what four days later um Kavik notes he hasn't seen Yang Chen once in that time he's there at the kind of uh the, the tea house of course where like Akudan and Taigum are and it's obviously because like Yang Chen has been basically banished exiled so she can't really be around the area to a certain degree um, uh, but then on the uh, fifth day afterwards, this is when Kavik realizes, okay, I have to give my report at this point. Um, so uh, we see how he kind of sneaks out and like it's noted that Jujinta is especially uh, suspicious and uh, is staying up until he knows for sure Kavik is asleep. So Kavik has to kind of uh, feign being asleep, including mimicking his own snoring when he's still actually awake. Uh, then he creates kind of like a an ice kind of a puppet of himself so that it stays in his bed. And uh, there's some subtle things here, like um, uh, even mentioning that, like, uh, what is it? A, a small sheet of ice to form a bridge over the squeaky planks in the floor. So just the little uh, tricks of the trade that he's kind of learned from the Order of the White Lotus, plus his own errand running of these just minor details to make sure no one can ever kind of find you and stuff like that. Uh, and it's also mentioned as well. Uh, he will, when he comes back, um, he will dry out his bed sheets um, using the technique he was practicing uh, when we were first introduced to him in this book. So it's all kind of uh, coming back uh, together here. So anyway, he goes outside uh, and eventually finds his way to a tent uh and there is a what's it uh, a tent with a circle drawn in the dirt on the front so kavik gets there scratches out the mark with his foot and we get an order of the white lotus kind of uh wording planned conversation situation uh warmer than usual this time of year uh followed by uh, underestimate the night at your own risk you know, you you may be right. Can I come in and take a rest? Rest. I could trade you a tale from my homeland. Um, certainly, the wise man always appreciates swapping stories with an interesting stranger. The tent opens up. Kavik crawls inside and notes that um, the tent has like material that is kind of uh, specifically constructed to muffle sound, so they can speak openly in here and no one outside can hear them. Um, and Kavik is just like, we really got to update those codes. Like it felt like we were talking as if we were like hundreds of years old at this point. Um, but uh, the, the, the White Lotus member here is just kind of like, we have people who have been stationed for years without meaningful contact. Changing the passphrases too frequently would leave them in the cold. What is your report? It is revealed that this is Doe from the previous um, uh uh, kind of white lotus stuff so this guy the guy he nearly broke the ankles of uh, this is who he is reporting to here uh, and he just goes through the idea of like yeah a unirak said yes i can deliver a report to this guy in particular so uh yeah he explains the full situation about exactly what happens and doe is straight away like this is what happens when we let children sit at the big table uh, and again like keep in mind doe is not some like wise elder like I th they described that he was only like uh what was it like 10 years or something like that older than um Kavik so uh, he's like under 30 here and acting like oh the children sitting at the table type stuff um but yeah unanimity is gone and um, the avatar ordered me to deliver this message um uh if the meeting at Taku goes ahead uh the, the nations are at risk 
we need to warn them, we need the help of the White Lotus to get the kind of word out. That's the kind of idea here of like the safest way to approach doing this is to uh, actually kind of work in a way sort of with the world leaders to like make sure that we switch up what happens so that it doesn't go ahead like that. But of course, the White Lotus are somewhat meddlesome in this era to a certain degree. When they decide to actually intervene in something, they, as we see, as we've seen before, they can have quite an impact on, on what's going on here. Maybe not in the right ways, but uh, he, what he says is, um, you know, but uh, <clears throat> if it doesn't go as planned, Chaisi will suspect we're onto her and withdraw uh, the firebender. We'll never get as good a chance to find and take control of him. We can't give the world leaders any warning that something is amiss. So again, the White Lotus focus here is almost completely on gaining control themselves of Thapa, of the combustion bender. Like that is their focus in all of this over anything else. And Kavik is pointing that out. You know, the the White Lotus is willing to gamble with the fate of the four nations. And Doe is just like, war is a known quantity. This firebender and his technique is not. And then Kavik notices that like as he goes into, you know, I am presenting the White Lotus opinion on this, uh he becomes almost like fanatical with the way he like recites the white lotus kind of philosophy on a situation like this the white lotus is an ancient organization it uh, has seen conflicts come and go rulers too what it cannot abide is an unchecked power running rampant across the world we already have one of those and you know her well so even that is a bit like yikes on the white lotus side of things that they view the avatar as like this unchecked power that they have to constantly monitor that they feel that that's the way that they have to approach doing things and like you know it's sort of like i guess that is something in the world with the avatar it's like you know <laughs> should there be someone watching over them type thing it's, it's an interesting idea but given what we actually know about some of the errors of the white lotus in this era it's a bit like yikes like i can't believe you're um you know blaming and um being so cautious around the avatar when the white lotus d do what they do in this era uh, we have fought for balance longer than you can imagine and of histories you could never dream of um our, our best results have always uh, been achieved by maintaining the grip on a few vital reins of power while scorning all else whoever controls unanimity at the end of this struggle will have um, the means to reshape the world to their liking uh, we can't let it fall into anyone else's hands even if it means risking the life of a monarch or two and even that is a bit like I get the White Lotus is an old organization, but you're also like basically saying that you are above the Avatar almost when it comes to long fights for balance when the Avatar goes like so far back in history. Um, uh, it's kind of insane that like this is like a counter argument to what's uh, being discussed here. Um, and Kavik's like, you know, okay, and what if everything just completely falls apart in Taku? What will the White Lotus do then? if like the worst comes to pass and we lose world leaders in this conflict and and this is the the true response of the white lotus here like this is how they approach doing things they will meddle but then they will watch from afar we'll watch this crisis unfold from a distance and adopt the best position to help the four nations in the aftermath as we have done for generations do you believe a would tell you differently and he's like in his head no she, that's exactly what she would say but I still don't like it. I still don't like agree with it is Kavik's kind of approach here. We see that he is honestly like truly frustrated that this is their perspective on things. And he notes that Yang Chen would have abhorred this, this line of thought. Um, and, and he understands why she doesn't like the organization if that's how they operate. Because Yang Chen just does things completely uh, the opposite of this. Um, and the, his instructions are basically, you know, do not leave the Avatar side in Taku. If she, fi if she finds leads on Thapa, tell us. Um, Kavik points out, like, you're spying on your ally more than your enemy. Like, that is completely backwards. Their logic, of course, is that we don't have a plant inside of our enemy. Um, but I will relay your message to Ayunarak. Uh, you know, 
just do what we tell you, basically, is, is the, the takeaway here right at the end. So he heads back to the, the tea house and he just stops for a second and he has just a moment of like pure frustration where he just like swings his fist at the air uh, and is just like, do what we tell you, we know better. And it says here, Kavik had been hoping for things to start making sense when he joined the White Lotus, but so far it had been no different than living with Kalyan. So he is comparing the White Lotus to effectively um, aspects of growing up with Kalyan, and I suppose especially like the way the meeting with Kalyan went in the first book, which was, um, I'm in charge now, just do what I say, I, I am above you, that's the, the, the kind of uh, difference here um, that the White Lotus and the control Kalyan kind of has over him. It's very similar. And again, it should be noted as well, the connection there of like the two people effectively asking him to betray Yang Chen, Kalyan in the first book, the White Lotus in this book. There's another comparison between the two of them there as well. So um, fascinating chapter, like really, really interesting stuff here. Um, it is the epilogue to like the the big event, of course, that we got here. So like we find out, okay, Mingyur is fine, but he might not uh, be able to hear anymore. Um, Yang Chen gets banished from the uh, exiled from the Northern Air Temple. That's pretty crazy. Uh, we get the whole connection with like Thapa sent the letter, and then the confirmation that yeah, he just betrayed everyone to make himself a more important kind of like piece in the middle of the the game that was being played. Um the the specifics on like there was a kind of some climbing rigging stuff going on to assist with the escape. So there was uh, kind of planning ahead of time on this uh, operation. Um yes we get the confirmation that uh, Zhao Yun and uh, Ying Su are dead. So we are down to one combustion bender that's a huge reveal just kind of like by itself the even the moment like earlier on in the chapter where yang chen sends the village captain flying out uh, tells you like how kind of bad in a way things have gone and uh the, the 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 kind of team meeting catching us up with everything um and you know the just it uh, it's it's a chapter that I think accomplishes a lot. Like it's a chap it's a chapter where you understand why it is quite a long one here to cover the amount of ground that it actually does. Um, but you know, important stuff. Uh, even just furthering the kind of Yang Chen Kavik kind of dynamic here, where she definitely gains a little bit more kind of trust in him because of his reaction, and then seeing kind of him on his own still feel the same way about the white lotus of like you have to view it as like um he's he's still kind of quote unquote being forced into situations to kind of protect the people he cares about um but if given the choice his loyalty is with yang chen and her approach over white lotus um and he even is, you know, you can see here beginning to grow frustrated with Kavik. And a lot of it is just like, he's my brother. Uh, I feel I owe him. That's why I have to do this. Um, but Yang Chen is kind of where his uh, actual loyalty is. And then, yeah, the, the White Lotus stuff at the end. Um, I really like the way they are kind of characterized where like it, <laughs> it's... It's, it's obviously, like, if you really like the White Lotus, this could be a little bit like, ooh, like, my favorite group. Like, they're really doing a number on my group here. Um, but it speaks to the, the kind of ups and downs across the eras. There's obviously some eras where the White Lotus are, like, hugely important and, like, are the kind of, like, wise organization that they say they are. But it seems like in this era, they are just another player in the game who, like most people playing it, think they are the best when actually they're making just as many mistakes as everyone else and um, so that's kind of part of the the issue here of like we know better and it's like do you and especially when they just want the combustion manners and it's like to what end it's like they're not necessarily fully saying it's just to keep them out of the hands of other people because that's what Yang Chen is doing, but they're like, we don't trust Yang Chen to do it. <laughs> but then, like, what are the White Lotus planning to do with, with uh, them or him? Because uh, there's only one left. It's it's a fascinating um, exploration kind of uh, that we get here. So uh, important chapter, but uh, they're my thoughts on it. 
in the comments. Let me know what your thoughts were, but that has been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.